dilute particle systems, which uh, can be accessed in Chapter 5 in the free download book, The uh, Fundamentals of Particle Technology. And in this particular lecture, the topics discussed are uh, illustrated here. A very large range of topics, including the well-known Stokes' settling equation, particle Reynolds number, drag coefficients, and what to do when we're not in laminar or streamlined flow anymore. That's when we have a significant amount of inertial drag, form drag, in the process, which we check by a Reynolds number. It's a different type of Reynolds number to the conventional flow Reynolds number, the threshold being only 0.2. And at the end, a little bit of discussion on industrial clarification. OK, starting then with the, the field forces and drag. Everything starts very simply. Fundamental equation for any force is mass times acceleration, Newton's law and this is no different. But if we had to weigh each particle individually that would be very tedious. So rather than weighing individual particles we use their diameter. So what we're looking for is the particle diameter which as before I'm using x to represent. If we convert that to a volume by cubing it and then multiplying by a volume shape factor then we can simply convert that now to a mass by multiplying by the solids density. So this gives us the mass of a particle which if we multiplied by the acceleration due to gravity gives us the weight. We have to consider a buoyancy effect, at least when we're dealing with fluids that have a significant uh, density. And we, we use Archimedes' principle here, that uh, a body wholly partially submerged in a, a fluid experiences an upthrust equal to the weight of the fluid displaced and it, the common belief is that Archimedes discovered this whilst in his bath, simply getting into the bath and uh, displacing the water and um, the way that we use it for our, our body force down here is really to take into this term the solids density minus the liquid density because the upthrust is going to be equal to the weight of the fluid displaced or well, the weight of the fluid displaced is going to be exactly the same volume but multiplied by the density of the fluid for the weight of the fluid displaced obviously multiplied by g as well rather than write that out separately then we can simply take into account the difference in densities between the solids density and the fluid density. So what you see here isn't strictly the weight force, it's the Boyd weight force. We're going to equate this to drag. They're the only two forces that we're going to consider at this stage. Um, so that's the Boyd weight and the, fl the fluid drag. The fluid drag comes from the quite well known but very complicated and difficult to solve from fundamental principles the Navier Stokes equation. So the Navier Stokes equation making the assumption of just streamlined drag, no inertial terms in it, comes down to this much simpler form here, which was derived by Stokes back in 1890 something or other. So it's a, a well known equation, an old equation, and it's a, a drag force equation. So this is a force, it's a drag force, 
equal to minus because it's in a different direction to the weight uh, 3 pi viscosity of the fluid particle diameter again and then the terminal settling velocity so that T down here is representing the terminal settling velocity and the whole of this gives us a force in terms of Newton's SI units if we wanted to consider the momentum of the particle um, then we could certainly do that using force equals mass times acceleration again the mass is not going to change it's just the velocity that changes so we can bring the mass outside the term here so the inertial force of the particle is simply mass times acceleration again uh, there's our mass expanded in terms of volume and density again and there's our acceleration term here okay well you'll find that we will ignore the inertia of the particle in the rest of the lecture there are some other important body forces um, perhaps the most important from particle technology consideration is the centrifugal force and that's due to a centrifugal acceleration we can have a, a discussion about centrifugal, centripetal and various other things later on but this is really a conceptual way of looking at why particles move outwards in a viscous system so if it's in a non-viscous system obviously they'll move tangentially um, whereas in a viscous system uh, the com slightly more complicated is it gets caught by each viscous um, streamline so the only difference between our weight force here and our centrifugal force here is simply that we're replacing G the body force term, the acceleration due to gravity with r omega squared hence there's a certain g force which is the multiple of 9.81 between comparing between these two terms here the rest of it is just the same volume times by density to give us the void mass of the particle r is radial position and omega is angular speed si units seconds to the minus one which we calculate by calculating the radians per second and the radian is a dimensionless unit so it's seconds to the minus one there are other forces, other body forces there are forces due to electric fields and um, forces due to temperature gradients as well so that's electrophoresis if we make the particle move in an electric field thermophoresis if we make the particle move in a temperature field these are notable forces when dealing with gas cleaning so when we have small particles in gaseous fluids then these become important but in liquid systems they're less so and they're very much appropriate or relevant when dealing with some fairly small particles less than 10 micrometers typically okay well something else that small particles can do is slip between the molecules of the gas because they're now so small that um, they can slip between the mean free path between the distance that the molecules have between them and what I like to do is ask this question down here if we've calculated a settling velocity based on a continuum where the fluid is completely surrounding the particle then clearly if the fluid isn't completely surrounding the particle we no longer have that continuum and therefore streamline drag around the particle clearly the settling velocity will be faster than calculated by a, an equation based on streamline drag well in liquids still talking about very small particles we might find that we don't have particle settling at all because of Brownian motion 
the molecular bombardment of the fluid molecules might keep the particles, the small particles, suspended all the time. And that's typically important for particles one micrometer or less in diameter. So particles less than one micrometer, there's a good chance they're not going to settle because of that molecular bombardment or Brownian motion. However, they will still settle in a centrifuge because that r omega squared term is that much greater. We can force them to settle in a centrifugal force in a centrifuge. Okay, what well, Stokes' settling equation then, the well-known settling equation. Here we have a simple particle settling and illustrated on the diagram are these streamlines. So it doesn't really matter whether the particle settles down in a stationary fluid or if the, sta the fluid is passing a stationary particle. The same fluid mechanics exist in that we have these streamlines. Uh, the streamline that's closest to the particle is clearly going to experience drag from the particle surface. So this will be moving slower than the one next to it, than the one next to that, than the one next to that. So these streamlines are representing uh, different velocities as you move away from the particle surface. Eventually, if you move sufficiently far enough away, then there's very little disturbance due to the streamlines, and they should become a constant velocity thereafter. And here is our viscous drag term. We've dropped the negative sign for simplicity. That's our Stokes's law viscous drag term, Stokes's drag. So simple balance then between these two here, the weight force and the drag force, gives us the terminal settling velocity. Clearly we can arrange concentrating just on that term there. And this is what we have. A bit of simplification, the terminal settling velocity then is the particle diameter squared, the density difference between the solid and the fluid, acceleration due to gravity, all divided by the viscosity. So if you're settling things in treacle, obviously, obviously they settle a lot slower than if you're settling in air. This equation though is only valid so long as no inertia in the fluid is present, because that would create extra drag. It's also only valid for low concentrations. In theory, single particles settling in an infinite fluid. And another important aspect here is that it does tell us, this equation does tell us, that bigger particles settle faster than smaller ones, unlike what is quite often regarded as being something defined or first discovered by Galileo, in that particles, big cannonballs, small cannonballs, settle at the same rate when thrown off the top of the Leaning Tower of Pisa. Galileo spent a lot of time looking into wind drag and he knew a lot, a lot better than to say that they don't settle at different rates. Of course, in an air system though, the drag, the viscous drag, is a lot lower. So they are pretty close. But in a viscous system, clearly, we've got a viscosity term at the bottom there, and a diameter squared term on the top, so bigger particles do settle faster than smaller ones. And we can have a method of particle size analysis based on this. Over here we have the Andreas and Pipette, and you can see that there's a lot of particles settled at the bottom, a few fine particles waiting to settle, and after a while we can suck up samples from a position up just above the base uh, into the pipette bulb here for weighing and drying and then weighing again to work out the concentration of solids and that is a, a well-known rather old-fashioned technique for particle size analysis based on the concept that if we take a sample early on it should have all the particles in suspension if we take a sample a little while later, we've lost all the red particles, just blue and yellow, and a sample later still, we've only got these yellow particles left. So it's a way of particle size analysis based on Stokes's settling equation. Sure, it's old-fashioned, 
but there are plenty of modern equipment that uses exactly the same equation to, for particle size, including in a centrifugal force. So it is now a technique that's used for nano-sizing particles even, very, very small particles indeed. Interesting consequences of Stokes' settling equation. Uh, the bigger particles settle faster. Very often we want particles to settle in an industrial process, so we deliberately cause the particles to stick together in what is called coagulation or flocculation. And the commonly accepted definition between or difference between these two terms is that a coagulation is something created by uh, typically a salt changing the ionic composition of the fluid whereas a, a flocculation is typically caused by a polymer maybe a natural polymer more likely a synthetic polymer which glues the particles together as they glue together this term here becomes bigger settling rate is very dependent on particle size so clearly we can make the particles settle a lot faster if the particles have a bigger size. It's possibly worth noting, just by way of passing, that if we glue lots of particles together, although the size gets bigger, the density of the solids will get less because we'll trap liquid in there. So it's not simply a case of sticking the particles together and getting a bigger um, getting a greater velocity. That certainly happens, but there'll be a certain amount of liquid trapped inside the particle aggregate as well. In practice, these two terms are used interchangeably, coagulation and flocculation, and probably more so flocculation will be used to cover anything where particles are aggregating together. So, here's an interesting problem then. It's particles typically have a negative charge when put into water. Uh, this is slightly unusual. This is iron oxide, which is predominantly showing a positive charge. The zeta potential is not really the charge on the particle surface, but it's uh, related to the charge on the particle surface. So let's just consider it as being charge particle charge for the moment. There's our zero point and here we have increasing particle charge near the surface and this changes with pH. So at a pH of about 9, 9.5 we have no net charge on the surface whereas a pH of about 4 we have a, a very high positive charge, 50 millivolts close to the particle surface. And this relates to colloidal stability. A colloid is just a, a very fine or a suspension of very fine particles and these are quite difficult to filter and to sediment. So if we're going to try and bring these particles together because we know that flocculated particles will settle faster, the question really is do we want to operate our sedimentation system at a pH of 9.5 or a pH of about 4. Is it better to have a high charge or zero charge? Question worth asking and reflecting on for a little while in the lecture. Of course the real answer is that we really ought to be operating at this point here, what's called the isoelectric point. And the reason behind that is that these surface forces that predominate are things like van der Waals, which will stick the particles together. If we have a significant charge on the particles, that would be a charge that encourages repulsion. So we have a, a force now that's encouraging the particles to stay away from each other, which of course is the opposite of flocculation. So if we're trying to sediment material, then clearly we want a pH close to the isoelectric. But if we want colloidal stability, the opposite, then clearly we would like 
to maintain a pH that has a significant surface charge or causes a significant surface charge on our particles. And that will help maintain the stability. So in terms of paints or some other colloid product where we want stability, then we don't want to be at the isoelectric point. Okay, a Reynolds number is always a ratio of inertial and viscous forces. That's the case regardless of the system, whether it's a stirred system, fluids flowing in a pipe, or fluid flowing around a, a particle. It's always a ratio of inertial and viscous forces. The same is true here, only we're now talking about this thing called the particle Reynolds number. And in the particle Reynolds number, we use the particle diameter rather than the diameter of a pipe, which is the conventional Reynolds number definition. For velocity term, it's the terminal settling velocity, it's the velocity of the particle relative to a stationary liquid. Most importantly, and very often confused, it's the particle Reynolds number, but we're looking for the drag forces in the fluid. So therefore, it's the fluid density. That's what's in the particle Reynolds number, not the solids density, but as, it's, as we're investigating what sort of drag condition exists in the fluid, it's quite logical. It's the fluid density and, of course, the fluid viscosity. But our threshold for significant drag is not point, for significant turbulence rather is 0.2. If the particle Reynolds number is less than 0.2, we perceive it to be streamline flow, laminar drag. Uh, for particle Reynolds numbers greater than 0.2, then there's significant inertial forces present, and we shouldn't really be using Stokes's drag equation. So how does that equate to a classic friction factor plot? Uh, here we are, this is the linear range where Stokes's law is valid, we have streamlined drag. There is of course always some form of form drag, some form of inertia in the liquid, but um, it becomes more and more important as the Reynolds number goes up the ratio of inertial to viscous forces, and we will conventionally use a value of 0 0.2. Below 0 0.2, the amounts of form drag are small. However, above 0 0.2, we now, start, we now see increasing form drag, as illustrated here, increasing degrees of turbulence in, in the fluid. And that's a drag coefficient or friction factor plot against Reynolds number. OK, so what's happening as we increase the Reynolds number? This is initially at low Reynolds number. We only have these streamlines around the particle and we can write and use Stokes' drag expression just here. If we move up to Reynolds numbers that are slightly higher than 0 0.2, then you'll notice we have this additional drag. These recirculation zones on the trailing edge of the, the fluid around the particle. And you can see these sorts of effects in wind tunnels as well, <coughs> when cars or aeroplanes are put into wind tunnels with smoke and you can see these sort of swirly bits around the edge. That's additional drag, that's form drag. So we have the viscous drag which is these streamlines just viscous shear over the surface and then we have the form drag, these additional forms of drag due to the shape of the object, hence the form drag. If we move up now to much higher Reynolds numbers, much greater than 0 0.22, there's now a lot of form drag present. And that will of course dominate. That will be the more important drag in, from the process. <coughs>
and that's what's happening as we move down our chart. Uh, typically, we will not refer to this as a friction factor. That is sort of convention for fluid mechanics, fluid, fluid flow through pipes and the like. Typically, we'll call this a, a drag coefficient rather than a, a friction factor. And we might give it the term CD. Okay, well we had a simple equation for predicting settling when it was laminar flow. What do we do in situations where we're significantly above that? The drag force here, or the drag force equation here, is related to the projected area of the particle and the, the shear stress. Okay? It's unusual, it's not logical to be the projected area. It's very tempting to think that that's the surface area that should be present there, but it's not. It's the projected area, which is the area that we would see looking at your particle down a microscope. So it's a sort of two-dimensional representation of the particle. So that's our projected area, and this is the shear stress, which is uh, newtons per meter squared, drag force per unit area. So if we multiply by the area, it gives us drag force. And here's our drag coefficient. And multiplied by rho u squared gives us the shear stress, or CD, if we rearrange this, equals R over rho u squared, our drag coefficient, as in the friction factor plot. So now we have two equations. The weight force hasn't changed, it's still as it was before, the Boyd weight. But our drag force now is given by this equation here, the value of CD in it. It gets a little bit more complicated. Okay, if we have these two equations, we can rearrange them for velocity. And we arrive at this equation here, only we have in this equation CD our drag coefficient. Whilst we're in this region here, we can make that substitution and of course we end up back at Stokes' law. Where we're not in this region, we don't have a simple equation between the drag coefficient and the Reynolds number, there are a whole raft of different correlations depending on where we are on that curve. And some of the correlations can be rearranged and the value of CD entered into there. Uh, as we move to a different rounds number, it's a different correlation that has to be used. So we can use this equation, but to use this equation we need to know the value of CD. Not a problem whilst it's laminar flow, because we have an equation relating that to rounds number. Only a problem really when we go beyond. So the problem really becomes we have to know the settling velocity to know what the Reynolds number is before we know what the right correlation is to use. There is a way around that, and that is a technique that was developed by Harold Hayward, and it covers all the different Reynolds numbers typically observed. So you don't need to know what the settling velocity is to use Hayward's technique. It is not an iterative technique, you use, you use it to find out what the settling velocity is. It's a little bit tedious, it's uh, Hayward tables if you're working it through manually, uh, but it is automated on the internet, on this website, and that's sort of freely accessible. So you can calculate the settling velocity of spherical particles using the Hayward approach, and that is done on this particular website. So the last part to consider then, having considered laminar flow and turbulent flow, is now what do we do with industrial clarification. This is a, a very simple well-known model of a rectangular basin industrial clarifier and the important part is always to calculate this thing here, the plan area is the most important part. So that is what we're trying to calculate. And the model is called a critical trajectory model. You can see that it's the trajectory of this particle which 
we have feed coming in on the left, overflow or effluent going out on the right, and the particle just settles and is just caught inside the rectangular settling basin before the liquid goes up and comes out the system. So if the basin was just a little bit shorter, this particle would be still in suspension, caught in the blue and taken out in the effluent. So we just want to capture the particle, just got to get that length right so that particle of that size is just captured. We'll do this conceptually by assuming that the particle is just settling in a sort of quiescent liquid, there's no turbulence causing re-stirring of the particle and so essentially we've got a, a simple sedimentation taking place top to bottom and of course a simple almost plug flow situation going from left to right. So here is our equation for our simple up-down settling which simply says that the terminal settling velocity is the height divided by the time so that's the height of the basin divided by the time taken to go from top to bottom and this is our equation for the volume flow rate through the system which is simply based on the, the volume of the system which again is the height times by the plan area Okay, so that's the total volume of the system divided by the time gives us our volumetric flow rate these two times are the same. The time taken to go left to right is the same as the time taken to go top to bottom. So we can equate these two times. It's the residence time to go top to bottom. It's the same as the residence time to go left to right. Two residence times are the same. It means that we can rearrange. And this becomes our expression, therefore, for the plan area of the settling basin equal to the volume flow rate divided by the terminal settling velocity and of course that's specific on the particle size we use to calculate that let's assume it's Stokes we could be using we could be interested in removing all 10 micron particles so we calculate UT for 10 micron particles for a given volume flow rate from our process we can therefore calculate the area required for that process to occur um, talking a little bit more about colloidal material very often there's a lot of material that doesn't settle out that can be determined by one of these plots here where concentration typically in parts per million or milligrams per litre is plotted against inverse of settling time and if that's extrapolated through to zero that then becomes one over infinity because it's the inverse of time and of course that therefore is the concentration of unsettleable solids those solids will not settle out so that gives us a way of calculating what the concentration at uh, infinite time will be and typically a long tube test would be where material is sedimented and samples are taken at different heights at each height the concentration is determined this plot in other words is determined and we can work out that the plan area again based on a, a time taken for material to settle if that gives the concentration, the desired concentration for the discharge let's say it was 25 ppm in which case clearly we need to leave it for 1 over whatever that time is and that, that would be a way of determining how long we need to leave that material to settle So, this particular lecture has considered the well-known Stokes of Settling Equation, um, introduced a new form of Reynolds number from the flow Reynolds number, which most people are familiar with. We have tackled the issue of what happens when we have significant drag on the particles. We can use the friction factor approach to determine a, a drag coefficient, or alternatively, we can use the Hayward tables and one of the online questions accompanying these lectures is based on the Hayward tables so I'd urge you strongly to try that and we've looked a little bit at the industrial clarification in rectangular settling chambers the Camp, Camp Hazen model <laughs>